Good morning again. This is our lesson 10 from the Baptist Expositor. This is a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Cave Springs, Arkansas. My name, of course, is Ernest Lostovica, and I'll be your teacher today. And we'll be reading Amos chapters 5 and 6. We'll start in verse 18 of chapter 5 and finish with the last verse of chapter 6. So, we see a horror story of woes to the people of Israel and Judah, God's chosen people. We often wonder why would it be so? It's because of the rebellious nature of mankind's heart. We are at enmity with God from the time we are conceived. We are born into sin, and unless something or someone comes along and changes that, we stay in that rebellious state. So, our scripture today gives us warning upon warning that's as important today as it was in the days of Amos. Chapter 5, starting with verse 18. Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it for you? The day of the Lord is darkness and not light. As if a man did flee from a lion and a bear met him, or he went into the house and leaned his hand on the wall and a serpent bit him. There's no place to hide. There's no safe place. Even in the own house, you can, be, come, you can come in contact with your own death. Shall not the day of the Lord be darkness and not light? Even very dark and no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feast days, and I will not smell in your solemn assemblies. Though ye offer me burnt offerings and your meat offerings, I will not accept them. Neither will I regard the peace offerings of your fat beasts. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy vials or instruments. But let judgment run down as waters, and righteousness as a mighty stream. Have ye offered unto me sacrifices and offerings in the wilderness forty years, O house of Israel? But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch and Cheon, your, your images, the star of your God, which ye made to yourselves. Therefore will I cause you to go into captivity beyond Damascus, saith the Lord, whose name is the God of hosts. Woe to them, beginning chapter 6, woe to them that are at ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye unto Cana, and see, and from thence go ye to Hamath the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border? Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seat of violence to come near. That lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and the calves out of the midst of the stall that chant to the sound of the viol, and invent to themselves instruments of music like David, that drink wine in bowls, and anoint themselves with the chief ointments, but they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore now shall they go captive, with the first that go captive, and the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. The Lord God had sworn by himself, saith the Lord the God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob, and hate his palaces. Therefore will I de deliver up the city with all that is therein. And it shall come to pass, if there remain ten men in one house, that they shall die. And a man's uncle shall take him up, and he that burneth him, to bring out the bones out of the house, and shall say unto him that is by the sides of the house, Is there yet any with thee? And he shall say, No. Then shall he say, Hold thy tongue, for we may not make mention of the name of the Lord. For behold, the Lord commandeth, and he will smite the great house with breaches, and the little house with clefts. Shall horses run upon the rock? Will one plow there with oxen? For ye have turned judgment into gall, and the fruit of righteousness into hemlock. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? But behold, 
I will raise up against you a nation, O house of Israel, saith the Lord, the God of hosts, and they shall afflict you from the entering end of Hamath unto the river of the wilderness. What a sad situation. But God will not tolerate complacency, arrogance, will not tolerate taking advantage of the poor to make your or make the rich life simpler, will not tolerate taking all the blessings of God and forgetting where they came from. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your Bible. All that we need to know, all that we need to know about our lives and how we should live for you and with you and worship and live in society with their fellow people. All these answers are here in the Bible. It's so simple. Love your neighbor as yourself. And love the Lord the, your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might, all your strength. My goodness, if we love God and love each other, we've already fulfilled the commandments of God. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day and what it means. And now as we look at this lesson, let us hold it up against our own lives, hold it up against our own churches and our neighbors and see where we stand. Forgive me, Lord, my sin. We trust your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We have to heed the warnings today. You can't look at the Bible and say this happened thousands of years ago and it doesn't apply to us today. We're still people. People do not change and God does not change. If we follow God's rule, we will be blessed. If we stand against his rule and go our own way and go astray, then we'll reap the consequences. We have to heed these warnings here of becoming complacent in our lives or simply satisfied with the worship that we do give him. We become worshipful, well, we become making worship habits, uh, ceremonies. Uh, it's just something that we do and don't understand that God is our mighty God that created us, created the whole universe, and we owe him our very next breath. That's where our worship stands. Are we really worshiping this almighty God, the master and creator of the universe, or are we substituting lesser gods of the pleasures of the world? Is it more simple to worship something that gives us pleasure than to worship someone that we owe our lives to? We say we serve a mighty God, yet we do it on our own terms. We ask people, why do you attend this certain church? And they say, well, it meets my needs. Uh, we are comfortable there. Who then are you putting first? Are you putting God first or are you putting yourself first? If you're comfortable in a church, well, bless your heart, but you need to be there to serve God and to worship Him and to glorify His name. Complacency. I'm saved. I'm satisfied. I'm going to heaven when I die. Well, you probably might be, but that's what Amos is trying to expose here in these two chapters. Here's what Isaiah had to say about it in the 29th chapter and 13th verse. For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart from me, far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Listen to who is teaching are they teaching the Word of God? Are they teaching social mores? Are they teaching social things and how to get along with the neighbor? All those kind of the things. God has rules, and that's what we need to teach. We say we look forward to the great day of the Lord, His second coming. Well, watch out what you wish for. Look at what verse 18 says again. It says, Woe unto you that desire the day of the Lord. To what end is it to you? If you are a religious person, but lost, you will be judged and condemned. John 3, 
17 and 18 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Those are simple words, but they're so true. You can do all the work, and you can be very loyal to your church. You can be totally devoted to the work of God, but if you don't have that personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and indwelled with the Holy Spirit, it's all in vain. So be very careful of saying, I don't believe. Those three words. You might say it like this. Well, I don't believe everything that the Bible says. You're condemned already <laughs> because you did not believe the word of God. I don't believe like that church. Or I don't believe like that denomination or that sect. I don't believe the way they worship. What do you believe? That's what's important. What do you as an individual believe? I strongly urge you to believe the truth. And the truth only comes through the word of God. And through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ, he promises to help you understand what he has written in the word. He said, I'll send you a comforter, and that comforter will lead you in righteousness. Today, we have many famous and influential speakers that write books, appear on TV. Uh, they have comments on the internet, and they stray from the word of God. They begin to invent their own theories and interject their own opinions. 2 Timothy 3, 4, and 5 says, this is coming in our day. He said, they'll be traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. And he says, from such turn away. If you find someone that makes Christianity sound like it's too good to be true, be very careful. Because Jesus Christ said, we will be persecuted by the world. Woe to those who are arrogant. You meet them every once in a while. My way of worship is right. And everybody else is wrong. Only God is right. Only God is right. God is righteous and holy. He's pure. Religion can never make a person righteous. No person can make you righteous. No church can do it. It has to be the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ that changes hearts. Jesus said unto the religious leaders of the Jews in Matthew 23, chapter 23, he hauls them over the coals and calls them hypocrites and many other things. Vipers, hypocrites. But look at verse 27 especially in Matthew 23. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Watch the people that spout out religion, because without the Holy Spirit within them, they are unclean. They may look the perfect picture of what you would think is a wonderful religious man, but full of uncleanness. Religion, no matter how good it seems, cannot save anyone. The fine church you attend cannot save. The preachers you follow cannot save. There's only one righteous, the God-man Jesus Christ. And God the Father says that by faith in him, his righteousness is given to all who believe. That's what I base everything on. That nothing I do is of myself righteous. But everything that Christ does through me then comes out as righteous. If something comes out of me that's unclean, you can bet it had nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. It was Satan's little chance to get in and needle me into a situation where I fail. The worship of the one true God when Jesus went through Samaria. We talk about chapter 4 of John quite a bit about the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well. Jesus stopped at the well and it's Jacob's well, the one that Jacob dug 
way back thousands of years before, and it's still being used, but it was in the northern kingdom, close to Samaria, Samaria, and that area was called Samaria. And the Jews never went there, unless they absolutely had to on some business or whatever. They didn't associate with the people because they called them a lesser class of people. They were a mixed people, Jewish and pagan and Gentile and everything rolled into one. But in John 4, verse 4, Jesus said, I must needs go through Samaria. The disciples thought that was kind of strange, but the Lord went. The area, of course, where he went turned out to be there at the well where he was thirsty. And perhaps you know the story of the woman that came and Jesus says, give me to drink of the well. And one thing led to another in conversation. She decided this man knew more than any other man on the whole earth. And she says, I see that you're a prophet. And Jesus went along with her, and they got to talking about religion. And she said, well, we worship here in the mountain of Samaria. And if you look at verse 1 of chapter 6, that's what it's talking about. Woe to them that are ease in Zion, which is Jerusalem, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. So, this is that mountain she's talking about. He asked her for a drink of water, and then that led to conversations, and he told her about his living water. And read that chapter sometimes. It's a wonderful, wonderful chapter of God's compassion for all people, not just the Jews. But here's what I want you to see today, verses 20 through 22 in Matthew 20, what did I say, 24? It should be 25, I think. No, I'm talking about John. We're in a different place. Forgive me. <laughs> here's what she said. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship you know not what. And that's what's our trouble today. We sometimes worship the church, worship the sect, the de denomination, uh, whatever, and we really don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. And we really don't know how he wants to be worshipped and needs to be worshipped. Having faith in the wrong things is as bad as having no faith at all. People say it's okay to worship God with any faith as long as it's sincere. As long as you're sincere in your worship, you're going to be all right. But unless it's a faith built on the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's to no avail. It's in vain. You worship, you know not what. And all the sincerity of the world then becomes vain. If we are not careful, we begin to give ourselves credit for blessings that can only come by God's provision. God blesses us, and we pat ourselves on the back and say, what a good job I did. Today, <laughs> we are, as a society, as a nation, we think... Wealth is power. If only I had the money, I could do so much more. People in church say, well, you know, if I had the money, I would really help the missions. If I had the money, you know, we could build onto this church. If I had the money. God's got the money. We just don't want to work. We don't want to go out and tell people the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. We just want to open up a checkbook and write a check and say, you go witness for me. Look at verse 6, 13. That's what it's talking about. Ye which rejoice in a thing of naught, which say, Have we not taken to us horns by our own strength? Those horns mean power. They have taken things into their own hands, and they see results and say, Wow, look what we've done. And they leave God out when it's God that deserves the glory. When Jesus comes again to take his kingdom on earth, Nations will be judged. Those left alive after seven years of tribulation, there will be a judgment. 
of Israel. There'll be a judgment also. That tribulation is the judgment of Israel. And after that tribulation, all the nations on earth will stand before Jesus Christ. All the individuals that have survived and all the nations that have survived will stand before him at his judgment. And that's in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, which I almost read a while ago. <laughs> this is the judgment of the surviving nations, starting with verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, that's that great day of the Lord, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when we saw this, when saw we the sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as you have done it into one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Then shall he say unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And he goes through it again. When I was hungry, ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick, and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when, when saw we thee and hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did, did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous in the life eternal. Who's he speaking to there? The survivors of the tribulation. Who's going to go into eternal life? Those that knew Jesus Christ. They didn't know him when they saw him because they were loving their neighbor. The ones that did not love their neighbor, they're going into eternal damnation, condemned. We're going into a millennial reign in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after this judgment, there will be no one left on the earth except the righteous. And they're the ones that are going to repopulate the earth. Those that failed, they're condemned. Judgment is severe. Condemnation is total. So at this judgment of the surviving nations, the righteous win today. The righteous win. Today we die in, the, in Christ. If we're saved, we're indwelled with His Holy Spirit, we have eternal life. We go to be with the Lord. Without Christ, we die today. We're hopelessly condemned. Condemned to eternal death forever and ever and ever. I hope this story spurs your curiosity to learn more of what Jesus has in store for all his believers. There's a great and wonderful eternity spread out before us. And as believers, we're already in it. In the concluding of this lesson, in this detailed warning message, Amos delivers two warnings against Israel. For one, one complacency, saying, we're children of Abraham. We're okay. God is going to take care of us. And two, arrogance. Where they do justice and righteousness invented by their own whims and wiles. Justice was perverted into self-indulgence and vile against, violence against the poor and the weak. At that time, worship became empty, 
and senseless actions of tradition and senseless noise. A lot of, lot of partying and calling it worship. Look at chapter 5 and verse 23, what he said about that. Take thou away from me the noise of thy songs, for I will not hear the melody of thy instruments. If you can't praise the Lord in song, don't do it. Don't try to give a song to God that doesn't give him glory. I will not hear it, he says. God has commanded true justice and true righteousness to be ex exhibited to reflect his glory. Everything has to be to glorify the Father in heaven. How sweet our lives would be or could be if we let God rule in our lives. Peace and contentment. We may not be wealthy, we may not be healthy, but we will be content and peace with God. Without his justice and righteousness, judgment has to come. If we leave out his justice, if we leave out his righteousness, judgment is going to come. But because of Jesus and what he has done for humanity, this judgment does not have to come to all who accept Jesus as their Savior. Because of his presence in the life of a believer, one can live with that true justice and righteousness. And when the day of the Lord will come, believers are safe. Believers are safe. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Simple statement. You have to believe in the Lord, and when you believe in the Lord, then you begin to do the right things at the right time and to glorify God in this life. It's nothing that you have to do and try to do. It's done by God if we just obey and love him. Pure religion, according to James 1.27, is undefiled before God, and the Father is this. Pure religion and undefiled. What do you think it would be? It says, visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Keep yourself from sinful situations and take care of those that need care. And that can only happen with a proper relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, which gives a proper relationship with others. And that's what he told us in the very beginning when he said that the two greatest commandments are love thy God with all thy heart and all thy might and all thy, all thy soul and all thy strength and love your neighbor as yourself. So that's that proper relationship that gives you pure religion undefiled that says visit the fatherless, take care of the orphans, take care of the widows in their affliction, and you keep yourself unspotted from the world. Well, if you're going to have a relationship with others, you have to have a relationship with Christ first. And you have that relationship with Jesus. And that's my prayer for you today, that you would find the Lord Jesus Christ. Drop your pride. Humiliate yourself before him, saying, I need you and nothing else. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that you allow us to have, even over the Internet. And Lord God, we pray that churches will soon be alive and active again and meeting together. And Lord God, it depends on you, but first of all, it depends on us and our relationship with you. As if we take this to you and trust you, then we have nothing else to worry about. Father, we thank you for prayer. In Jesus' name now we do pray. Amen.